it's, uh, you know, you just have to have a platform. That's the reason why people are famous is because they were afforded a platform. Not mm-hmm. just because they can sing or right. what kind of songs that they sing. It's because they were given a platform to thrive. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that is what artists are looking for. Is what platform can I have so that I can thrive in my art? That's why right. we chase labels. That's why mm-hmm. we try to get managers and agents. That's why we go to the, the vocal competitions. The comedy competition. That's why we've got America's Got Talent and American Idol and X Factor. Because artists need a platform to thrive. Hey, welcome to the Monique on the Mic podcast. I'm your host, Monique B. Thomas. This show is your go-to resource for professional and aspiring singers. Every Monday, join me for solo episodes and insightful interviews where I share real artist stories, practical strategies, and mindset shifts. Whether you're just starting out or already on your journey, you'll find the tools you need to transform your vocal path and feel supported. I keep it real, I keep it funny, and it's always useful and up to date. Let's get into it. I need a real warm welcome to my dear friend Marvin Parks. Hey Marvin, how you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Monique. No, Marvin, thank you for coming. I always thank artists because... Obviously, this show wouldn't exist if it weren't for the artists. There is no one way to do things. There's more than one way to do things. And if people can get inspired by your inspiring journey, then I've done my job. So I want to do things a little bit differently. Typically, when artists come on, I know exactly what I want to ask them as questions. But what I know about you is that you're prolific and you have a lot of things going on. And I know that there's some specific things that you want to talk about. So I'd like uh, to know. Prolific, what... that's a word. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you do a lot. You've got your hands in a lot I of different a, pots. Busy, yes. <laughs> and, and some of them are not what we would consider typically an artistic endeavor, but you're still out there doing things. So I'd like to know what's on your mind. Oh boy, I have now that's an open question. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> well, and let me I'm let me preface saying. that. Let me preface that by saying I know from watching you that you've had many an interview where people didn't respect your time and your energy by getting information wrong about you, which is an absolute catastrophe for an artist. And I, I just I, I want to make it, sure it can be very frustrating. Yeah. Uh, well, so, it's it's confusing in a in a bit because I do so, and the first time that people are really introduced of uh, uh, introduced to me, and because I do this in public every day, is that they hear me sing, whether it's a jam mm-hmm. session or whether it's uh, in the pair underground. Get into <laughs> I'm sure a lot later, mm-hmm. um, or on my record. Uh, right. My primary uh, reputation is that I am a purveyor of the Great American Songbook and of jazz music. Right. So when uh, other interests are introduced, and especially, um, you know, when you're reputed to have a a talent that's um, at a certain uh, level, and and I appreciate people's compliments, well, then after that, people want to, to know more about that. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, so, oh, well, I heard him singing uh, Nat King Cole. Mm-hmm. And so now he's a, he's a comedian. Oh, wow. I saw him at the comedy show. I never heard him sing. Oh, he sang at the comedy show. Okay. And so the, the singing makes the, the jokes somewhat forgettable. Okay. <laughs> Even if gotcha. it's a funny song. And right. then um, if they see me in the Paris Underground, well, then they think, oh, well, that's the only place that he's you know, singing. I saw him in, in Boston Tali Metro Station or at the Mark Kegunel Metro Station. Does he mm-hmm. sing anywhere else or does he do anything else besides singing in this place that I see him at every morning? Going to? Right. <laughs> and right. then, so when I want to talk about, you know, building a brand and, you know, and, and I'm interested in streetwear and content creation and uh, community projects and, you know, it's like I've been working on this particular brand, Jazz the Metro, mm-hmm. uh, for eight years. Eight and years. And so, um, eight years. I, I conceived it eight years ago. Wow. And um, so, when somebody comes in, 
and they're seeing all of these different things. Well, it's just, it's like when you go out to eat, right? And say mm-hmm. if you had eight courses, eight different try a little bit of this, try a little bit of that, oh, I don't like this. Maybe I'll try the next thing. Eight courses versus having all eight courses brought to you at the same time. That probably be a bit overwhelming as a diner, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, Although I could, that, I could do it. If it's good food, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but yeah, so that's sometimes people's approach um, or what they walk away from when they, you know, oh, wow, his voice. And then it's kind of hard to get to the brand and the things that the brand wants. You know. Right. So... Why is this branding thing so important that I want to you? accomplish to it? Oh, I'm sorry. It, well, I didn't hear you. But. Well, here's the thing. Um, this came to me um, years ago, and I went to see Barbara Streisand at a concert. Mm-hmm. There's a, um, a group called uh, Il Divo. Those three young men uh, from the, you know, like the three tenors, the whole three right. tenors. Yeah. And so they were in, and mm-hmm. I saw how they were packaged, you know, with recording, merchandise, tour, or the bit. And I thought in my brain, sitting there in the bleachers at the, uh, uh, at the Barclays Center, as an artist, how am I going to package this? Mm-hmm. How do I, how do I go from singing at jam sessions and trying to get a gig and, you know, on Wednesday night at the corner of the coffee shop, mm-hmm. you know, because we all had those gigs. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. really, being in the business, yeah, I'm still trying to get those gigs. Yeah, hey, a gig is so a gig is a gig. I package myself. Yeah, yeah, but how do I package myself and present myself to this industry, this business? Mm-hmm. Because Michael Boudre, I saw his pack. You know, I saw this packaging of this young group. You know, I was like, oh, wow, how did I do that? So fast forward to uh, my journey here in Europe, mm-hmm. where I had this idea for a one-man show because all of the humorists, all the stand-up comedians, and they Oh, wait, say that, say that last part. It cut it cut out the one one man show. Can you repeat the last thing you said? Yeah, I had this idea for a one man show in Paris mm-hmm. because I'd seen how all of the uh, humorous, how all the comedians, um, be they in French or in English, had mm-hmm. one man and one woman shows in mm-hmm. uh, in theaters. And so um, the show that I conceived was called Marvin Parks and Eric Yes. Mm-hmm. And I was impressed by how young people, having been introduced to me and to my music and to my singing voice, um, had been coming to support me. So 14, 15, 16 years old, showing up mm-hmm. at, say, Sunset, Sunset, Jazz, coming to see me because they saw me get natural. Mm-hmm. Or, or they'd been introduced to my music some other way. And I was like, hmm. I need to have a platform where not only I can kind of tell my story in a way that's entertaining and funny, but I can also introduce or reintroduce or to celebrate the great America. It, it would be a way to teach people about jazz who are novice and mm-hmm. also to share a little bit about myself. And so I looked for producers for this show. Mm-hmm. They were like, oh, well, if you want jazz, you need to go to blah, 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 jazz club. I said, well, I've already sold them out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I already know jazz. I said, mm-hmm. you heard, you know, show. And also, too, you know, when you're a jazz musician, you don't have your own show. It's the Moni Thomas Quartet. It's the Marvin Parks Trio. It's the Marvin right. You know, your own show. You're part of a band where you're the according to leader. You're not, you don't have a show, you need your own show. So, right. even being a, a community where their idea of what a jazz musician is is slightly different than what we're used to in America, mm-hmm. um, it was a hard sell. Right. A very hard sell. 
I mean, I'd been, I had, you know, had an album, you know, signed, being part of the uh, community project, which is uh, with the Metro uh, participation in. Um, so I was not an unknown singer. Right. In fact, right. I was on the radio in France before I arrived here because I mm-hmm. and was uh, featured on this album. So I said, well, I know what I want. And uh, also, we were talking about uh, my dear friend who passed, who was very uh, temperamental. <laughs> just say, oh, I, my con- I, I my condolences. Temperamental. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so I'm pretty much the same way. And, but I'm kind of seen as very uh, harsh when I, when I speak my truth. Mm-hmm. So, um, it, so that made it more difficult. But I was determined to go out and build my audience one person at a time. We'll get it one at a time. Right. <laughs> so in the same way as Barkers do in New York City, they have a show to promote. Um, I was using street performance as a meaning to go out and to engage the public and to personally give them an invitation and see me in a jazz club or otherwise um, in a stand-up comedian in Paris later. So they were mm-hmm. coming to see me in a comedy club. Right. When their um, experience with jazz is limited. Right. But when they're experiencing a live comedy show, they, they, there are people come to me and say, oh, I've never been to a live comedy show. I've mm-hmm. never been to a jazz club. There were young people that I sang for because they had put together a jazz night and I was a special guest. Mm-hmm. And they did not know the etiquette of being of attending a jazz concert. Okay. If we clap, they, they were whispering that they are. Okay, if we clap, I said, you better clap on this workout. <laughs> you better clap. <laughs> better clap. So, yeah, so my whole brand is not for people like jazz. It is for people. They or may not have experienced it. I'm 15 years old watching TV, watching film. So that was my interest. And so I know that there's a lot of people who um, like, like they, they tell me all the time they were still going. And so I wanted to use my platform as a musician in the Metro uh, to give people that experience. Okay. So let me stop you for a second because, you know, I know you more personally a little bit and yeah. I have a better <laughs> picture of what so that's this how looks I'm like. you. <laughs> but I just want for the people that are listening for them to understand how what you are doing and what you've done is so particular because first for in different ways first of all you know we tend to feel like jazz is for old people right you know mm-hmm. and you know even people say jazz is dead and what have you you are actively going out to grab these young people to tell them to listen to this music. You're actually going, because a lot of, I think a, a lot of um, people who, who love jazz, they love it so much, they just feel like, well, you know, everybody should love it and just know it, and, then, and that's just it. But you're actually going out to grab people. Now, unless people live in Paris, they might not know this, but like, you know how, uh, let's say, I think it's in uh, Chateau d'Eau and Chateau Rouge, where you have those hair salons where they have people that as soon as you come out the metro station, they grab you and they try to get you to get your hair done. But you're doing that for yeah. jazz. Yeah. You're doing that for jazz. And I think that is so amazing because people tend to think that music like jazz and, and classical music, it's, you know, it's conservative in the fact that it's, you know, it's for older people. And I, and I love that you're actually going out and trying to include people who don't typically yeah. listen to jazz into jazz. Because well, I've always said, my... sorry. Yeah, it has just um, been my, uh, you know, and I do this every step. I wanted to integrate this into my professional life. And not just jazz. After I saw how successful I was on on the jazz side and and I, you know, started doing stand-up, I was like, well, I see them coming to see that too. I had kids from Victor Hugo's bringing Mm -hmm. their moms to see me at the mic at at, a... um, at the Pan Am, and mm-hmm. so I was like, "This 
connection between culture and community mm-hmm. is like, like, this is something, um, you know, that's worthwhile. When we go to New York City and you see the Naked Cowboy, uh, if you're familiar with the Naked Cowboy, he, he's got a gimmick where he does cowboy boots. And he's got his, mm-hmm. But he's wearing Fruit of Loom. That's all he's wearing. <laughs> Fruit of the Loom, okay. Underwear, right? Mm-hmm. And then slips his calisons, his draw. And he's um, playing guitar and he's entertaining people, but people come up to him and he's in deep. And uh, he built the brand around that. And I had the idea in my brain. I said, well, what if I did that? Because I saw how many people went up to him, even on day one when I first started doing it, uh, to talk to him. I'm very approaching. Mm-hmm. Um, so people talk to me. Some people tell me the most personal thing. Wow. So the music is a, is a conduit. Yeah, this one lady who, I was visiting here with her husband to celebrate that she had um, survived breast cancer. Oh, wow. There was another young man who just stopped and said, hey, you look, you seem like somebody I can talk to. I'm a mother. I'm not that she's passed. It. She's not passed. It. There was okay. another young lady who had issues with her housing, with her lamb. Mm-hmm. You know, all the stuff he was doing. That was t- okay. You have it's like but then the 12 year old kid who passed me and said well my mom um took my phone because my grades are slotted mm-hmm. and so i said hey if you need any help with your work you know just let me know but his mom had actually used the principal so oh, <laughs> okay <laughs> wow. yeah yeah it's it, i mean it is a rabbit hole on um, storm but the music that is being played in this skinny little way mm-hmm. uh, has been a conduit for me to engage this community mm-hmm. in a way that is to third. Even mm-hmm. with our uh, public safety in the metro now, and you, mm-hmm. you've seen my post about public safety in the metro. We'll talk about it. It's given me an, an opportunity to, yeah, I, it's given me an, an opportunity to have an ongoing discussion with local police and with the workers, the controllers, and those security guards that mm-hmm. always it seem like they pay bully, they tickets and then all of the kind of stuff. I know them in a way that most people don't. I know their humor, I know mm-hmm. their grace, I know their jokes. Um I've asked them how long have they been working, you know, as an officer. They know they call me by my first name, but not Bonjour Monsieur, Bonjour Marvin. Mm-hmm. Flat out. So Mark, that is has, so my point is that music has a way, music has a way, and, and, and in this case, jazz, a way of touching people and moving people in a way. And then when you put that with humor, oh that's the one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, is, you know, it is, it is music, but it's also, it requires a driver and you're that driver. I think it's interesting because we both know that the life is, of an artist can be a struggle, whether it's just, you know, it could be mental health because it's just hard living as an artist or a financial or just a I'm plethora. That way. What, you, with the mental health or the money? Yeah, I said, I'm the, oh, no, no, the, the mental health. <laughs> Okay. I was going to say, if you blessed with money, can I borrow $5? <laughs> <laughs> I get $5? But, but my, my point is, you're a special person to be able to have enough mental energy with all the struggles that we deal with to be able to reach into the community and, and, and try to develop this community. You know, Do you see what I'm saying? Like, we are often struggling just yeah. to get our art seen and heard. And you're actually building community through your art and and through this community building people are becoming fans of you i think that's amazing and it's it's highly atypical well it's not necessarily i'm looking for fan because no i know you're building your community yeah. well 30 years ago when i when i first saw nat king cole in a documentary 
Mm-hmm. That that the cold unforgettable was the biggest album on the planet. I mean, she was mm-hmm. beating rappers <laughs> and yeah. rock stars at the time with with Cole Porter and Gershwin and and you know. That's, um, I love that at fifteen years old, and I said, I have to learn those songs. That was right. my first thing. Not I want to be a famous singer. Not I need I make a million dollars. Not how am I going to be a big star? It was I have to learn those songs. That was the first thing. And then as people were telling me that I shouldn't be singing those, that I should be doing something, I said, but why not? Every time I sing them, people like it. Right, right. And you like it. People like when I, yeah, I said, but people like it when I sing these songs. Even Mm -hmm. thugs, even even the hardest hard Right. Because also, and I think it has to do with my kind of sense of humor with it too because I, I do take it seriously performing I don't take myself very seriously my thing is that I'm just having fun with something I really do and that right. kind of that has a point but yeah. for me it's not so buttoned down and serious and old timey and old clothes it's yeah. just oh well it's, it's Marvin you know I was singing them songs oh Marvin you sound so, it's so, so funny you're singing Winky Dink or whatever this different <laughs> brand songs or whatever this song is and so that has always been endearing for people. But the person that really influenced me, and, and I really got there, well, then it showed up on stage. Say that again. You said Tony somebody. Bennett. Tony I Bennett. When Tony Bennett uh, showed up on MTV mm-hmm. in 1994 on Unplugged, and they had like Eric Clapton, they had. Lord only knows who else was on MTV and Tony Bennett shows up with a mm-hmm. jazz trio wearing a suit and tie. And I was one of those, I was 17 years old looking at them. There were 17 year olds in the country looking at them. There were right. 17, 18, 19 year olds in the audience during this tape. And so what I took away from that, and of course with Natalie Cole together mm-hmm. being the number one album, I said the only thing you have to do is show up and do it. Right. It doesn't matter who's in the audience. You're singing for the little kids. You're singing mm-hmm. for the, the teenagers. Tony Bennett was almost 70 at the show. Was really, when that album was really, and they won a Grammy for it. Mm-hmm. I, that changed the whole perspective on whatever it is that you do in life. You have to find a way to reach people with what you have. Right. Mm-hmm. So the 17-year-old in Tony Bennett's audience on MTV in 1994, fast forward to the young man that approaches me in the Metro at, uh, at who's 19 years old in 2020. Mm-hmm. Or, 20, or, or 2020. It's, uh, you know, you just have to have a platform. That's the reason why people are famous is because they're afforded a platform. Not mm-hmm. just because they can sing or right. what kind of songs that they sing. It's because they were given a platform to thrive. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that is what artists are looking for. Is what platform can I have so that I can thrive in my art? That's why right. we chase labels. That's why mm-hmm. we try to get managers and agents. That's why we go to the, the vocal competitions. The comedy competition. That's why we've got America's Got Talent and American Idol and X Factor. Because artists need a platform to thrive. And if right. they're not given one, well, then you have to work very hard to build your own. Right. And sometimes people get it and sometimes do not. Right. I found Musicians to Metro as a community project in which, because you have to have a card to sing there. Looks like right. you're getting thrown out. And eventually I, <laughs> I was afforded the uh, ability to do it. But some right. people don't see that as a platform. They see it as you need a platform. And I'm like, right. no. This yes, is your platform. That is brilliant, Marvin. Kids, though. Because kids are dancing to my mm-hmm. to my music. I have a small speaker with mm-hmm. MP3s from my phone, of, of play, either from my own album or things mm-hmm. that I found on the internet of mm-hmm. Fly Me to the Moon. Um, the unforgettable, uh, of Sinatra covers, uh, uh Nat King Cole covers, Ella Cup, and people are asking questions. Where does this song come from? Mm. Who wrote this song? Did you write this song? Where do where can I find? Where can I find you? People are even giving me suggestions on where I can. They had mm-hmm. when they should have been throwing me out. Yeah. <laughs> 
one of them spent money on an autographed copy of my body. Oh. Wow. I've seen RATP. I've seen transit workers in my audience. Mm -hmm. I have seen transit workers dance in the station. Oh, wow. While they're well, they supposed to be working. <laughs> well, they, wow. they might be passing on their way to wherever, wherever they're going. But mm -hmm. I've seen them do a two-step in, mm -hmm. in the station. I had one officer stop. And he should be giving me a, a, I mean, a hard time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And he stopped to, to tell me what his favorite jazz was. Wow. There's one that I'm friends with even now. I saw him yesterday and gave me a fist bump and was coming up with the steps. <laughs> I did not have my, my metro ticket to get into the station. Mm -hmm. First, he, he casually walked by because he was in a rush. He told, oh, you can't sing here. You got to go. Mm -hmm. So he found out that I had, he said, do you have your ticket? I said, man, I have So I was getting the penalty from the guy standing on my right. The guy mm -hmm. in front of me was watching the floor, make sure, you know, it was safe. And this gentleman on my left, he and I had started talking about Charles Asnifor. Mm -hmm. Charles Asnifor, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just in context, it's such a humorous situation where this is okay dealing with now the other officers talking to everybody's favorite speakers. Right. It, it's... Uh, engagement and also I've gotten um, gigs from being in the metro. Right. So right. people pass by, you know, can you sing my party, can you sing my, my wedding? Um, I became a comedian mm -hmm. because there were two comedians who were passing by who stopped to listen to me sing to America. Mm -hmm. And they and I told them about and um, what I wanted to do with this. Oh, well, you should come because we host the open mic. That's how I got introduced to comedy. So okay. It is just like, it's just this incredible exchange where I get to meet people from all over the world. I don't mm -hmm. like being filmed. That is the one thing that, oh my God. And you know, you're in public, people just, they don't think, they just react to it. I'm not open to the film. But yeah. sure. And sometimes I'm, I'm very, very kind about it. And sometimes <laughs> I'm strict about it. But um, it developed into a series called Metro Equals People. Metro equals people. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I was interviewed on television. They asked me if I'm already an established artist, why do I still sit the Metro? Mm -hmm. I said, because of the people that pass me every day going to school, work, you know. Um, so they were, uh, they wanted to film me. So I put it on mode. And so I said, there were commuters who wanted to, to film me singing. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I'm going to put this on selfie mode and I'm going to record us together. Okay. And the tag at the end is Metro equals people. Metro equals people like my friend Monique. Oh, <laughs> Metro I like that. Metro equals people like my friend from Brazil, from Canada, Israel, from India, from, from California, from, from Maryland, from Florida. Metro equals people. Hmm. And so I would, um, even when I go out, and um, and I go to certain events, like I saw Lettuce too recently. Mm. I saw a uh, Christian make a lot. Oh, yeah. honey, don't get this stuff on that. I know, I know. Swedish, she is the Swedish, she is talented. Yes. Um, and so I got her to do the Metro Equals People video from her dress code. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, so there's a, a series either in my Instagram stories or on YouTube. I have... So many videos to uh, do uh, edit of the, <laughs> you know, people dancing, people offering their own talent, people telling me their stories. Some of it, sometimes it's just a straight end. Okay. Right. And um, so, yeah, so it's my own platform, my own content, the media. And, uh, you know, I hope it, it builds into an actual media company where people right. are learning about. Paris community, but also obviously about um, jazz music in, in America. This is so big because, you know, as I interview different artists and no two artists are like, I think younger and up and coming artists are having to deal with the idea of what they think an artist or a successful artist is. And people tend to think that there's, you're either Taylor Swift or you're starving. 
And one of the things that I'm seeing with the wonderful artists that I'm that I'm very lucky to be able to interview is that the ones that feel like they're successful is because they're doing art on their own terms. Mm-hmm. You are doing art in the way that Marvin Parks wants to do art. And I it think is that is important. Survival. It is on my own survival because I thought um, that if you're on TV, I got my band on TV, mm-hmm. and I thought if you're on the radio, and I thought that it's, you know, you can sell out the room, somehow uh, those things matter. Right. And they often don't. I can't tell you how many times that I've, you know, gone to certain um, organizations mm-hmm. and people think that you should be, you know, working with them or you should be somehow promoted or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's met with a yawn. Or sometimes you don't get uh, the emails returned. I know someone who is very well known. You know, we know a lot of people who are very, very, very well known. Yes, we do. And I was surprised to learn that a certain artist here who's very well known was not getting her emails returned. I said, wait a minute, you, but you on TV, you on the radio, you got a festival, mm-hmm. you got record, you know, and they not responded to you. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not doing so bad. You know? Right. Right. I was saying, though, maybe I said, you know, if she's not getting her emails, I said, maybe it's not just me. Maybe I need to like, you know, that. Well, I think, you know, the thing about being an artist is figuring things out. I mean, we figure things out artistically. You you know what I mean? Like, Mm. I I always say that I find creative solutions to creative problems. That's one of the things I say I do as as a voice teacher. But, you know, that extends to life. And I think, and this is also the reason why I wanted you on here today, is that you're showing yet another way of going about things to be able to exist in this very cruel world sometimes, but on your own terms. See, the other people, so for you, success seems to be, like, again, living on your artfully on your own terms. You're being able to connect with people from all over the world, from all walks of life. You are actually creating your and own you opportunities. To, I said the young people that you were talking about, young artists too. And Work should be with going. Mm-hmm. Work, like getting a paycheck, getting yes. paid. Yes. In return. Like that's a lot of kids with, with videos on they, they you know, I'm posting it on, on YouTube and I'm posting on, you know, I'm singing my song on Instagram or I'm singing mm-hmm. it on TikTok. Mm-hmm. And you know, maybe Justin Bieber, how we got discovered was was, you know, he was on YouTube and I should found him and, and you know, mm-hmm. that worked. Mm-hmm. But also the day to day, um, people think that oh well, it's privileged to have me sing in your club. Or oh, are they letting me play here? And it's like mm-hmm. when I show up, my first thing is how much are you paying me to be? <laughs> what are the right? Conditions? And yes. so younger artists are so into I got to get my song out. I got to get you know I got to you know play play on a stage mm-hmm. that they're not asking the hard question. How do I get compensated? Right. How much pay? And when do I get paid? And then all of those things matter because, you know, even if I sing in Metro, people are giving me something. Yes. So I'm not going to sing in Metro and make 100 euros, and I'm then that's whatever. <laughs> 100 euros, for example. Right. And I'm not going to sing in your club just all because I want to be exposed and I want a chance to sing. Yeah, exposure doesn't pay the, the phone bills. It, no, it don't. Look, mm-hmm. so, you know, uh, so yeah, I, I meet a lot of young, and even singing in public, the way that I do, I, I so talent mm-hmm. that I need. I just told you about the community that I found. The singers that I meet. Oh my God. Even the participation in this Metro, which you have to, you know, pass the audition, you go to the Metro. And you see a band playing that is kicking butt. Mm-hmm. You go to the metro on your way to the doctor point and going to pick up your kids, and you hear this killing song. You hear this killing song. Yeah. It's hard play. It, it, it makes you stop and just turn your head and be like, 
do? Who are you? Right. Young lady, right. where, where can I find your your, your work? <laughs> because your body of work. So much talent. Yes, there is. Yeah, it's but it's so much talent out there. If you you would probably get two or three people to start a group just at Monop. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 intense. It's incredible. Watch, you know, or, or to see young so many young people out here, but you know, want to create. And even mm-hmm. on the branding side of it, you know, um, I've had a chance to talk to young people who are building their own brands. Mm-hmm. And see, branding is not as superficial as people or uh, vain as people think it is. So when you mm-hmm. think of a brand, you know, and I have this Jazz the Metro hoodie on, when I say I'm going to start a super yes, brand and, you know, and all that, people will be like, you know, why does it have to be a brand? And people have $300 hoodies, <laughs> you know, right. which that is a thing. But also, streetwear as a platform to express yourself is totally mm-hmm. the reason why Bobby Hundreds, Bobby Hundreds uh, is celebrating his 20 um, as a streetwear brand and as a media platform. He started as a kid who loved art, he loved drawing, and his parents discouraged mm-hmm. him from doing that. They thought, oh, well, you should be, you know, pursuing something else that's viable. And not just drawing these, you know, these silly pictures. And he started putting his work on shirts. Right. And he had a blog. And he was connected to people in his local community. Now he has collaborations with like some of the biggest labels. He had one with WWE. He's had uh, Grant. Just so mm-hmm. many other things. But, and he's getting opportunities as far as um, creating content now. You know, and, and building up the media part. So mm-hmm. branding works in a way where, you know, I sold I, my T-shirts for as much as 50 euros to someone who, who had never really listened to my nice. music, but he likes the idea of branding and what it stands for and all of those things that I told you about. Because imagine you, yeah. you spend four hours trying to prepare for a gig. You got to get dressed. You got to get mm-hmm. your charts together. You got to get transportation to the gig. You got to make sure you can get the right position. What if one of the positions can't make it? Blah, 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 blah. And then at the end, you get 75 euro, euro for, for three hours and above. Mm-hmm. Well, right. I 75, uh, somebody paid me $75 for my hoodie. Yes. Like that. And it didn't take you all oh, day. It, and you could do something else while they're buying that hoodie. So I could be writing my jokes. I'm gonna be writing my music. I could be selling other hoodies. <laughs> so selling other hoodies, yeah. Right. So you know, a brand is not a bad thing. Yeah. You know, um, the first person that bought one of my Jazz de Metro items was in Kansas. Mm-hmm. She had never been to Paris. Mm-hmm. She had never seen me sing in the Metro. She saw my content and said, "How do I get a show?" And mm-hmm. then she saw what I was doing here and said, how do I get in? Right. See, yeah. I so, I just yeah. love that you're, you, you're not just waiting for opportunities to fall from heaven because, I mean, one could say, you know, you, you, you're, you're insanely talented, this voice that, and not just the voice, but what you do with your voice and your knowledge, because you've done your, your due diligence, you know, this music and, and one could be tempted to say, well, that should be enough, but you're like, no. It's, I'm going to create not. my own platform. I I actually want to. Well, you know. Yeah. Uh, on that, you know, um, this entire brand mm-hmm. is built. I mean, at the very very base of this, let's not talk about hoodies. Let's not talk about when you sing the bar and club. Not about our branding and all that. It's old jazz, the metro thing. At its base, is from how people react upon hearing the sound of my singing voice. I don't know about, we're not, not at Metro East, East yet. We're not at we're not at Southeast yet. <laughs> we're not at, at seventy five dollar hoodies yet. Yeah, we're talking about content because people don't they're not introduced. Sometimes mm-hmm. they, they follow my fight hashtag, and then I get followers on on Instagram. We're almost mm-hmm. at ten thousand followers, by the way, and it's 
Yay! About three, wait, about 300 people. At, wait, how long have you been on Instagram, just to give context? Um, I started this in 2019, my right. Instagram page in 2019. Because at okay. first I was doing it, I was just lumping it all together on my on my Marvin Parks page. And I said, no, I need a separate thing from the brand. Gotcha. So it's been a slow build. Right. It, it's all organic. Yeah. Organic, so yeah. So the very base of this is that people hear me singing. Mm-hmm. And it's the second they stop. It is the second they turn their head. It is the second I get their attention mm-hmm. by singing a song in this board. And you can hear me from what I can hear me as soon as you come in the station. Now, those who are listening who might think, okay, don't really fully understand. Great American Songbook is the music that, that was the pop music of, of the day. A certain era. Mm-hmm. Things that came from as early as vaudeville, from the Chitlin Circuit, mm-hmm. from um, film. Tin Pan Alley. Broadway, musical. Yeah, Tin Pan Alley, um, which. Yeah, well, those songs that were from Broadway musicals, I mean, a lot of those might have been on Tin Pan Alley. Right. To, to get them, you know, out there. So, yeah, Tin Pan Alley from movies, from TV variety show, um, things that were used in TV commercials, um, anything from that era that was the popular music and that has, the, has jazz, swinging jazz, those are the songs, and, and we point to the names. We all know the names. Nat King Cole, Sammy mm-hmm. Davis Jr., Rat Pack, mm-hmm. um, Nancy Wilson, um, Ray, sir. all those people that we want, Tony Bennett, mm-hmm. um, uh, Dean, I said Rat Pack. All that. So yeah. those are the names that we point to when we think of that music. And there is a category called traditional Right. Key word traditional. Traditional. Nope. Key word. Uh, and people also point to Christmas. You mm-hmm. know, like the Bing Crosby special, the Andy Williams specials, the Judy Garland. Judy Garland. Good Judy Garland, Garland. Yeah. <laughs> Judy Garland. Yeah. And like I said, I had not seen an under 40 black uh, performer out there like that. I thought when Natalie Cole was successful, I thought, yeah, I thought those flood games could be. Open, yeah. When I saw Harry Connick Jr. being successful, I thought the floodgates would be open. Sure. It was not. No. I, when I saw Tony Bennett on MTV Unplugged, that the floodgates would be, be open. open. Yeah. And the music market does not work that way. No, it doesn't. So but I said. Luckily, there's people like you to remind others that this body of work is out there. In fact, this is funny because I just recently pulled this out. You know what this is, right? Of course, you know, there's this Ella Sings the Great American Songbook because I'm going to be, I have two, um, I'm doing some jazz vocal camps, uh, one next week and one in August. And um, the whole point of it is for people who want, to, who want to get started as jazz singers, that they, you know, get started with a particular list. So a certain number of swing tunes, a certain number of, of blues, of ballads, Latin, waltz, Ballad. and, and, and that type of thing. And so I'm like, you know what, let me pull this out. Let me pull this out again. Because I want them to go beyond just the songs that I know. This this body of work is here as a reference. I mean, and it's not the only one, but it's the most extensive one that's been recorded by any one person. And I, I'm feeling like, you know, people and even need, you know, and even as a songwriter, <laughs> and even as a songwriter, mm-hmm. um, this body of work has influenced me in a in a way that when people approach my original song. They mm-hmm. can't differentiate between right. whether it's a jazz standard from the 1940s. Well, that's true. That's right. true. I've heard some of your songs. I have a song. Yeah, well, I have a song called Public Safety Message, <laughs> which I wrote and started and started. <laughs> now we're going to get into the pickpocket stuff. Okay. So I wrote this song on the spot, having a uh, witness for the thousandth time someone almost get robbed right in front of me while I was singing. Right. And I um, t- 
I was yelling, at, you know, because the lady was not paying me any attention. Mm-hmm. She thought, oh, well, he's just, he's just he's singing. Boring. He's trying to get money to waste to it. But I don't, I don't want, um, but I saw the guy following her behind the stairs and mm-hmm. about to go into her pocket. Mm-hmm. And I yelled. And, and, and just so you know, a lot of us artists playing the Metro know who the pickpockets are. Right. Because we've seen them at work. We know mm-hmm. them. I'm a little bit more involved than anyone you, else. You're not a little bit more involved. You are involved. Um, <laughs> you're being modest. Because I've seen them doing it. Mm hmm. Which is kind I've of. I've seen the bags get open. I've seen people get stalled. That is so it's like bizarre. bodacious to do that right it in so front of you. It's so bizarre to watch in real time. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, because I'm un- very unassuming. When mm-hmm. you see me, I don't look like a musician. I don't have mm-hmm. a microphone. Mm-hmm. I just have a hat propped up on my knapsack and a little mm-hmm. speaker. Mm-hmm. So for really, unless I'm like really singing, I mean, sometimes people stop to talk. And they pass and say, "Are you a musician? What are you doing? Are you just what are you Oprah now? Is that what I'm giving you? You know, <laughs> like what's going on?" So, so my appearance does not look like I am performing. Mm-hmm. All you hear is music. All you hear is the guy singing. Mm-hmm. So easy to just kind of walk by me and try to get one over. Mm-hmm. And I popped them, where I made an announcement. I cannot stand there and watch a woman carrying her baby in a stroller up a, up a flight of steps to mm-hmm. not follow her and not say anything. Right. I cannot see a 70-year-old woman walking down the corridor with her knapsack and seeing somebody approach her and not saying anything. And they're cowards. They're yeah. like dogs with no teeth. And they try to act like they're all big and bad and mm-hmm. whatever. But, you know, I'm from Baltimore. So... To have witnessed this, and it's so mythicized that sometimes people don't even take it seriously. Right. It's so mythicized. Um, and also, it's not who people think it is. Sometimes he has those young girl kids. Sometimes they grow men and women. So anyway, I wrote this song, and um, I, I was yelling, trying to you know, preaching people on the platform and people don't have context. So I saw this guy yelling. I'm a freak guy, 250 pounds, and I'm yelling. And so they're like, um, can you calm down? <laughs> that was getting scary. But I started to sing what I was preaching. Mm-hmm. And so pay attention became pay attention. <laughs> mm-hmm. Pay attention. What? Watch your stuff. Pay attention. Became there are pickpockets in the metro. I saw them do it. Pay attention. Pay attention on stairs. Hold on tightly to your waiters. I saw them do it. Attention. So catchy and so jaunty. It does look like sound like something that came out of an MGM music. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like My Fair Lady and what? Right. Right. You know uh, the rain. It's guys and dolls beyond the plane. There. Yeah. Pickpockets. With the guys and dogs. Right, exactly. And, um, and it's become endearing to people to the point where I've heard little kids sing it <laughs> in, the, in the subway. There right. was an officer ad. The guys that normally show up at this station were mm-hmm. there, two of them. Mm-hmm. And we've had our battles physically, verbally, whatever. And sometimes when you have an enemy that you fight, sometimes there's a detente in a relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, you go away, I'll go my way, whatever. So I started singing the song right in front of him. Mm-hmm. He sat down on the steps to watch me perform the song. It was <laughs> such a funny moment. <laughs> you can't like this stuff. We got to it. So the reaction was, one, oh, dude, you can go F off because obviously of the subject matter. Mm-hmm. But then there was a part of him, and I could see it, was that this is a guy who I fight all the time and he's getting a kick I'm getting a chance to like sit and watch it and listen to me say and I'm singing about pictures in the metro with him so right. there's an so I'm looking at him sing the uh, listen to me sing this this song mm-hmm. and my speaker went out because the battery got his speaker mm-hmm. and we had a brief moment 
where we were laughing mm-hmm. together about how I'm sitting here trying to fight him with my music, but the speaker went, ha, <laughs> so. ha, ha, you should charge your speaker, bro. Ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I, so, so it's kind of a natural thing that you would go into comedy because you, you seem to find, even though you, you are serious about what you do, but you don't take it too seriously, but you find comedy in, in everyday life. I want to punch him in the face. <laughs> yes, I know. I've heard, listen, I've heard your stories about the Metro. I wanted to be a comedian since I was a kid. And I was one of the kids that always made my family laugh. Always mm-hmm. had something smart to say. We'd have mm-hmm. family dinner. Me and my friend Tony would do uh, the roundup of what happened in service. Nobody <laughs> was safe. Both our parents, we rose past while he was at, was while he ended up at the table because our, our parents, our respective parents, were off to the church. So my grandmother would make these big dinners and invite everyone from the church, even the pastor and his wife. And in the family gathering, the other like that, we would roast everybody by a grandpa, and they, you know, they laugh, but you know, we would roast everybody, We'd get everybody. This is how you sound. In church. This is the way you were dancing when you went church. This is what the organist sound like when she's trying to sing. Mm-hmm. Everybody. And um, I wrote a song called The Ugly Song You're a Mess. When I was a teenager. Say that again, The Ugly? Finish it until nine years later. The What's ugly it called? Song, you're a Mess. It is on the, my first EP. It is called The, the ugly, ugly Song. Song. Okay. The Ugly Song. And I wrote the song when I was 18. I was 27 when I finished it. Just randomly, okay. I just recalled it and just wrote the song out. Mm-hmm. And um, that was my first foray into writing anything comedic. Um, I wanted to do a uh, an open mic that I happened to find in Washington, D.C. I was too scared to do it. I said, what am I going to talk about? I have mm-hmm. nothing to talk about. And right. every age was getting there. And it was an open mic. So sometimes the jokes work. Sometimes they don't. Um, that's the whole point of an open mic. So, like, you know, even a singer, you know, testing you out your you know, testing yeah, out your stuff. Right. right. So um these jokes were not funny. And I said, I know people who are funny. I didn't say I was funny. Fast forward a few years later when I'm in New York and I get to sing the others mm-hmm. at Birdland Jazz Club and became the final track on my first EP. Oh wow. The ugly song you're a mess. There was another thing called a bringer show. And bringer shows mean that your, the order you go up depends on how many people you bring. So okay. if you bring 25 people, then mm-hmm. you'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, you got his boys, you got his crowd, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you might be one of the first ones up. Okay. I did not have one of this. I didn't have two people. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so, and I brought a band to play the ugly song. Yeah. Oh. But comedy. We were in a comedy club, uh, and and specifically in this situation, they ain't trying to set you up. You got to go up there, get on the mic, and tell you to do your act. Yeah. So, but they're not looking for no, oh, I need to plug in my amp, because this is not a music club. This mm-hmm. is a comedy club. And um, I bombed so bad. And it was terrible. I never did it again okay. until I came to Paris. And so the more that I was performing, the more comfortable I got with myself mm-hmm. that I could talk to the audience. I had their complete attention. So when I was hosting jam sessions, I was hosting jam sessions, not just calling names on a list. Mm-hmm. Put them up to where are you from? Where you go? Saying, tell jokes, do funny stuff. If I have a, a fellow performer, I like a solid, mm-hmm. and you could do funny stuff. Mm-hmm. I can sing pickpocket songs. Mm-hmm. and tell, say funny stuff. But if you are humorous, there should be a space for you to show people you can humor and to engage them. Right. You have to have a community of people around. There's one thing to have a father and fame. It's another thing to have a community. But a community have your back when they can't be. Yeah. That would be it. You know, sometimes it's not money. Sometimes you just want people to show up. Sometimes you just want to this. This this is so good, Marvin. You know, because the whole point of this is to really give resources to the up and coming singers. And these are things that we don't hear. These are things we don't talk about. You know, 
often when we talk about community or we're usually talking about fandom, but in this sense, and if we think about life in general, you know, in the earliest days of man, community was a question of life and death. And it's the same thing for an artist. If we don't have that community, it is the death of an artist. Now, I know how busy you are. I got to ask you one last question before I let you go. If there's one thing you could say to an up-and-coming artist that they'd need to know or do, what would it be? Don't let anybody tell you that, uh, believe, yes. Because mm-hmm. if you don't believe it, how are you going to convince other people? Right. You, you don't even really have to convince them. The whole point is in art to tell you a story. Mm-hmm. That's, what, that's what art is. It is a manifestation through a song, through your dick, through your uh, visual your painting that's what that's what art is it is a it is storytelling manifested and that's what you have you can't let anybody tell you that you what you have to say about your life and your story is not important right it is it is important well i so you got to believe in yourself yes you you and you cannot waver on the things that you want I can't wait for people to discover the many facets of you, who you are. When I say many facets, singer, actor, voice actor, comedian, um, could we say Batman in the yeah, metro a, station? Yeah, in a video game. How about that? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I saw that, too, and in a video game. And, and we can add to that uh, metro activist, community creator, content creator, all of the things. And you do it in a way that's so much your own and and i wanted to add up one other thing because you you are a baritone right yeah you know yeah that's a particular thing because on the radio what we typically hear most of the time from a male voice is some sort of tenor so not only have you built a platform you know with well if for a bass you know like very yeah. white like if you're very white or if you're um the, the young man from a Boys to Men, Michael McCary from Boys to Men, mm-hmm. the bass. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Um, oh, goodness. I, I want to say, not Lou Gossett, who, who wrote Deja Vu for uh, Isaac Hayes. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Isaac, mm-hmm. the brain part. Isaac Hayes. You know, <laughs> right. those are the basses. Right. But, you know, but the crooners, Baritone, Ben Cross, Baritones. And, yes. Uh, it. Yeah. Baritone. Yeah. Baritones. But we hear... We hear less of them in the mainstream media. And so it's wonderful that you're building this platform without without having a plethora of um, people to follow, so to speak. And so I, I just want to encourage right. everybody out there that if they're in a place where they don't see or hear anybody that's like them, they can still build their own platform because Marvin Parks did it. I thank you. I th- I thank you, Marvin Parks, for being you and even giving somebody else a template that they can aspire to, even though they'll do it in their own way. Thank you so much. I look forward to everybody um, discovering you. Well, I'm trying to use my platform and build my community, too. <laughs> thank you for the point. Well, yes. well, keep, keep the, we need you. We need thank you. We, we need 10, 10, 100 of you. But, oh. but thank you for giving us this platform and for making it with them. Oh, it's such a pleasure. It's such a pleasure. And I can't wait to come and see you. The next time I'm in Paris, I'll definitely give you a heads up so we can get together and have some coffee or something. Okay? All right, Marvin. I love you to death. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're really liking what I'm throwing down, you'll love my Mike Masters newsletter. For more information on how to work with me and to sign up for the newsletter, visit www.uniquebthomas.com. That's www.uniquebthomas.com. Musically, 